evening. Good morning, sorry. <laughs> Technology. Oh, yeah. I think when with technology, and all my technology, like my phone, everything works out. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not like all at once. Testing one, two, three. Oh, let's see here. Testing, testing. Testing one, two, three. Okay, I'm just a little low. Well, congratulations, Andy. Very good. Super proud of you. Okay, if you guys can let me know if you can hear me. So Melissa and Zoom and those of you on YouTube, if you guys can just let me know whether you hear me. Good morning, Melissa. Can you hear me? Okay, 100%. Good. Very good. Okay, guys. I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate that. And it wouldn't be a Monday if I wasn't having issues, technology issues. So, um, so my two uh, other cameras are not working today. Um, and my stream deck is not being recognized, so it's going to be really hard for me to advance these slides. So kind of bear with me. It's, um, I don't know what's going on. It's Monday. Yeah, I've got all of this technology to kind of help me you know, with these presentations, mm -hmm. but it's just one more layer of things that can go wrong. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was here early today to get it all set up because I was afraid of that and it still isn't working. So, because I shut everything down for the, the storm. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And now I can't get it to recognize. So, all right, well, we'll just, uh, We'll just move on. <laughs> okay, so does anybody have any questions about your homework? Oh, 
Oh, um, I just show you from the article. It's, uh, it says it on the website that you can click on the link and sign up. Well, I did that, and I feel like any video is like that. It just helps more seriously and achievements and stuff like that. The videos help me get attached with me. Okay, so let me, um, let me see if I can do this. Hold on one second. I've never tried this before, so we're going to try something new here. I really need a assistant to work the computer for me while I'm teaching. <laughs> okay, so. So let me go to full screen here. I don't know if this will work, but give me just one second here. I've never tried this before. All right. Well, this is this is the main website. This is for your CNA.com. Um, I can't show you the very top. It's cutting off the very, very, very top where the address is. But this is for your CNA.com. And okay. And it won't scroll. See, I've never played with this before. Ah, why did you do that? So this is the ebook. This is where you sign up for the ebook. It's not an audio book, it's an ebook. An ebook is like a, a like a book that you read. It's just not in physical form. You read it on the screen. Oh. Okay. And unfortunately. Good morning. Yeah, this isn't let this isn't what I wanted it to do. So I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, that doesn't really help us. Um, I'm going to have to figure that part out in the browser. But if you go on the main website, foryourcna.com, sounds like we were on my course website. So I have a main website that's open to the public. Everything on there is free. I have review videos on there. I have the animated lessons on there, the practice tests on there, the personality quiz to help you find out your workplace is on. So it's got a lot of free information. That's for your CNA.com. And then I have, and that's what's on the front of your book. So the front cover of your book right here. And then I have courses. So it's courses dot for your CNA.com. So courses and is right at the front. That's the online program. That costs money to get into. You guys are enrolled for free. If you, you got that invitation on the first day, if you accepted that invitation, that gets you into that courses site for free as part of being in my classroom. Okay. I'm really young. Hi. I'm very frustrated with it. <laughs> find anything um are you sure you're putting in the number four or are you typing it out i need to put in the four cna i just go to the um link and click the box that link in the email is a one-time link and that's to get you enrolled in the course but then you the 
So after um, the second class, you got an email from me that wrapped everything up with links to video, the link for the course is in there as well. But if you go back and click on that invitation email, it's actually going to tell you you're already enrolled because that's just to enroll. It, it doesn't, it's not like an access link. It's just for enrollment. But after class, say after class, and I'll, I'll on the computer where I can get you up here, um, I'll walk you through it. Because I don't want you to be frustrated. I want you to know where everything is. But there's two, we have two sites. And only because, I mean, it's just, it's way too much information for one single site. It overwhelms my server. So I had to split the course off into its own site because all of the videos and, and everything, it's very, very tech heavy. So anybody have any other questions on chapters five or six, what you did for the homework, five or six? One. Okay, so in the book, the blue book, it showed two people rolling somebody. And in the book, they had them rolling for them. Right. No, right? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Like I, I said, watching is different too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, there's going to be discrepancies between the blue book and what I teach you. Mm -hmm. Always go by what I teach you. The blue book has good information in it until you get to the skills chapters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the skills chapters, you're going to like, they want you to wash your hands before you um, enter the room, you know, before yes. you address the patient. And that's before you touch the curtain. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Not a good practice. Um, yeah. But, you know, different. Like, Textbook authors have different ways of presenting information. I'm not saying that one way is right and the other way is wrong. It's just different ways of presenting the information. But my way is specific to the text. Okay, so to illustrate why I teach you the way I do, pull this up. These are the checklists. Well, actually, let me, let me do the yellow one. These are the checklists, okay? On the back of the check, or on these are the care plan sets. On the back of the care plan sets are the checklists. So one of the check the checkpoints for every single skill, every one, is understand your precautions and infection control. Did the resident refrain from touching resident until hands are clean? That's a specific checkpoint. And if you're touching the curtain, then your hands aren't necessarily clean. Mm -hmm. So the evaluators, some of them are going to be fine with it, no problem. Other evaluators are going to say, no, it has to be directly after washing your hands. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I did was I took these checklists very literally because the evaluators take them very literally. And that's what I use to create the skills. Okay, they're based on these grading sheets that you're grading on. So yeah, there are going to be some discrepancies for sure. Yeah, that was the one. It was just the, the two the two <laughs> CNAs rolling the person. Yeah. Only well, maybe it's two, but you know. Yeah, no, unfortunately, you're gonna see that. In a lot of videos online, you know, it's um, it's bad body mechanics mm -hmm. because of weight distribution, but it's also bad general form, just because you never want the patient to be face level with right. you know. The one was under the crotch, and the other one was on the boots then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just not it's just not good form. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong, uh -huh. right? Okay. So if you see it out there, you know, don't go crazy on your coworkers. <laughs> um, I just want you to kind of have a a, a different way of thinking about it. Okay. All right, so.
Um, let me get your scores. So um, tell me your first name and how you did, how many you missed on five and six. So we'll start with you. Uh, Chloe and um, Chloe Okay. Do you have three and four for me as well? Uh, three I didn't and four I got it from the other one. Two? Like three or four. Four. Okay, that's fine. Are there any that you want me to explain to you? No. It was more like I just need to read them in the book to like know where and what they were. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, and your name? Gallery. Uh, five, I got zero wrong, and six, I got zero wrong. Thank you. And what about four? I I got four. Yeah, four, I got zero. Very good. Okay, and I'm, I am trying to learn your name. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> Karen, um, on five, I missed one, and on six, I missed one. Thank you. And your name? Amanda. Okay. Mm -hmm. Five and one, one six. No. Okay, very good. All right, the AC is not going to work today either. <laughs> I think we should just, you know, go home and start again. <laughs> All right. So any questions before we move on? No. All right. It's been a while since you were here. Quite a few days have passed and there was some excitement in all those days. So let's review to make sure that you remember everything that we need to know moving forward before I start showing you some new skills. How do we know what to do with each patient? Okay, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing. nothing. So, do we add anything to it? Nothing. What if we can't follow the care plan for whatever reason? Okay, all right, we notify the nurse. While we're following the care plan, if we make any observations of any kind, what do we do with that? Very good. Okay. My computer's making noises. I don't know why. <laughs> Too much technology. Okay. So once we've done our, um, or once we know what to do, we've got to start the skill. Every skill starts with the opening. What does every opening start with? A knock. A knock. Why is it important to knock? <laughs> Privacy. But also the patient needs to feel somewhat secure in their environment. And if they have strangers coming in and out without notification, they're not going to feel secure at all. Um, once you in, once you knock and enter the room, what do you have to find out about the patient? Their names. Okay, their name. So you're going to either address them by name or you're going to ask their name. Either one is fine. And once we've established who they are, what do we need to tell them about us? Um, Okay. Our name and title. Very good. Now, once all the introductions are out of the way, um, we're going to tell them what we're doing. And then we're going to ask them a very important question. What is that question? Yeah. Is that okay? Do I have your permission? Can I? Something along those lines. Once we get permission, then we're going to close the curtain because now we've got permission to move forward. Don't close that curtain too early because then that kind of sends a signal to the patient. We don't care if you agree, <laughs> you know? So it is it is best to kind of wait until you get that permission before you move forward with closing the curtain. Once you close that curtain though, we've just talked about this, the curtain is not considered clean. So what do you need to do after closing the curtain? Go wash your hands. And after you wash your hands, you can get your supplies. Because we have clean hands. So we have to have clean hands to touch clean supplies. What's the very first supply we should get? The barrier. The barrier. 
And we're gonna put that on the table and then go get the rest of our supplies. And that's because when we're gathering supplies, we don't want them to touch our uniform. And if you're trying to spread that barrier out, you're holding it up against your uniform, it's gonna contaminate your supplies. Um, so it's the very first thing we do after hand washing, we're gonna go, go, go get that barrier and we're gonna get the rest of our supplies too. Now, one of the supplies we have to think about is gloves. We're going to evaluate gloves for every skill because remember, gloves aren't based on the skill, they're based on the patient that we're doing that skill on. So how do we know? What are our three rules? How do we know if we need to wear gloves? What are the three things we're going to ask ourselves? Ooey gooey. Ooey gooey, icky. Okay. Funny. Covered. Or okay, personal, personal skin. In text. Yep, non-intact skin. Very good. So uh, ooey gooey, personal skin, non-intact skin. If the answer is no to all of those, do you need gloves? If the answer is maybe to any of those, do you yeah. need gloves? Yeah. If the answer is yes to any of those, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you decide to wear gloves, if it's indicated for the skill, um, what's the first thing those gloves should touch? The patient. The patient. We're going to keep those gloves clean for our patient. And then once we've done the skill and our gloves are dirty, we have to be careful about what else we touch in the environment. You don't want to cross contaminate. Um, what, when you're all done and you're ready to remove your gloves, they have to be removed correctly. What's the way that we remove gloves? Dirty touches the dirty. Okay, dirty touches dirty. So we're going to pinch up first and pull that one off. And then this one goes underneath. You don't want a dirty glove to go underneath and touch your skin. So pinch up, pull off, underneath and pull off. And then we'll throw those gloves away. One of the other supplies we have to think about are privacy blankets. How do we know when we're supposed to use a privacy blanket? If they're undressed or uncovered. Uncovered or undressed. When we're putting a privacy blanket on, what do we need to be careful not to do with it? Shake, Shake it or snap it, okay. And we're going to put that on over the sheet and pull the sheet down. Why would that be important? Keep some cover. Keep some cover. Very good. Don't just pull the sheet down and then put a blanket on. You don't want to expose them unnecessarily. <laughs> um, at the end of the scale, we'll pull the sheet over it and remove the, the blanket out from underneath. That way the patient's always covered with something. Okay. Anything that we remove from the bed, what do we need to do with it? It's soil. Yeah. Okay. As we're taking it from the bed to that area, as we're removing it from the bed, what do what do we need to do with it to prevent cross contamination? Roll it, roll it. Roll it up in a ball. Very good. <clears throat> and then we're going to put it directly in soiled uh, linen. For the test, you'll have soiled linen right there by the bed. Makes it easy. In a clinical setting, can you put that stuff on the floor while you're doing other stuff? What do you guys think? No. Do you think dirty things can go on the floor? Can't remember. <laughs> okay. Really? Actually, no. No linens, clean or dirty, can go on the floor. No, nothing clean or basically nothing gets to touch the floor. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if we don't have a dirty linen hamper around, we're gonna go get a bag to put those linens in or get a chuck to put them on, but don't put them directly on the floor. Now, when we're um, working with linens, any type of linens, um, we're gonna go get them when, our, when we get our supplies, right? So we have clean hands to get our linens and we're gonna take those linens and put them on our barrier. We're gonna use what we need, but what if we don't use them all? They still go into dirty linen. Okay. Anything that you take off the bed, also look for any foreign objects, like hearing aids, dentures, that type of thing. Because somebody else may not be looking uh, as well. So clean rolls. Which way does clean roll? Toward you. Dirty rolls away. And this is how we put things on the bed. So if we're going to change out sheets, we're going to roll the dirty one and tuck it under the patient. If we're going to um, put chucks under the patient, we're going to roll it toward us and tuck it. So clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. 
Okay, good. All right. So if we're moving the patient in bed, are we using side rails to keep them safe? No. Why? These are much worse. Okay, side rails are a restraint. Yeah, we won't have them in all settings either. Um, some settings it's actually not allowed by law to have side rails. So you won't have them in all settings. That means we have to learn how to do this without side rails and keep our patients safe. So where should the patient be at all times in the bed? In the middle of the bed, absolutely. So it doesn't matter if they're laying on their back or they're laying on their side, they should be in the middle of the bed. And your patient will do this by themselves without thinking about it. But if you're going to be turning the patient, you have to think about it. You can't just roll them on their side because then they'll be on the edge. You're going to scoot them towards you first and then roll them away. So scoot toward me and roll away. You should remain behind the patients behind. So once we've got um, all of our supplies in place and we know how to move the patient and everything, most of our skills are washing skills. So we do a lot of washing. I mean, body cleanliness is a big part of what we do. So we have some rules we have to follow when we're washing things. And one of those rules is if I'm going to go get water, then I need a paper towel to turn the water on. And then I'm going to check the water. What temperature should the water be? Warm. Warm. Not hot, not cold, just warm. But just because I think it's comfortable doesn't mean my patient's going to agree. So who else has to check it? The patient. The patient. Whatever water we use, it doesn't matter what it is, the patient gets to check it. Always. And then once I'm happy and, and ready, we're, um, am I going to put soap in the basin to get soapy water? Why? You can't right, basins are no soap zones and you can't rinse with soapy water. So whatever we wash, we, whatever we rinse, we dry. Good morning. Okay, so whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry. Be careful not to get your surface wet. You know, so that means that we shouldn't have any drippy wet washcloths. So how do we keep our washcloths from getting, from being drippy wet when we're using them? Bring them out really well, really well. Um, and then um, after we're done with whatever we're washing and rinsing, and we're going to dry those areas, if lotion is indicated, what do we have to do before we put lotion on? Warm it up. What do we have to do after we put lotion on? Wipe off the excess. Wipe off the excess. All right, so now we got a basin that had some water in it, and all it had was water in it. No soapy washcloths went back in. It just had water. So we're going to clean that basin the way we clean everything in healthcare. We're going to take it over to the sink and dump it out. If it's normally bathing water, you can dump it in the sink. If it's anything that normally goes in the toilet, feces, urine, vomit, which is called emesis in healthcare, Anything that would normally go in the toilet, that's where we're going to put it. So don't dump urine in the sink, please. <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to dump it out and we're going to rinse it. And then we're going to set it down. When we set it down, we're doing it for a very specific reason. But we're not actually going to take that step for the test. When we set that basin down, it's to disinfect it because you can't be holding a basin with dirty hands or a dirty glove and disinfect it at the same time. So you're going to set it down. Now for the test, we're not disinfecting, but in a clinical setting, you will be in some situations. So the process is there for you. But now that it's disinfected, can you pick it up with your dirty glove or dirty hand? No. So what do you need? Paper towel. Paper towel. We're going to use a different paper towel to dry the inside and the outside. Why? Inside is clean or considered clean and the outside is considered clean. Right, outside is not considered clean. Okay. Uh, and then you're going to store that basin. Make sure you get it good and dry, though, because that that drawer is warm and dark. Mm -hmm. it gets yeah, so dry it pretty good. 
And then when you go to put it back in the drawer, you, what do you need to open that drawer? A paper towel. Okay. Now, some of the, so most of our skills are mobility, or I'm sorry, washing skills, but we do have some mobility skills. We're going to learn one of those today. But mobility, actually, we're going to learn two of them today. But mobility skills are like range of motion, um, walking a patient, transferring a patient, anything that requires moving a patient. And we have some rules for that as well. And we're going to learn those shoe rules in just a little while, but we already learned two of them when we talked about foot care. We learned that slipper socks are not enough. Why? You have to slip and step on something, there's germs. Okay, so they can slip. Those socks get contaminated and go back into bed with the patient, but they don't protect against sharp injuries. Mm -hmm. And we understand that patients with diabetes especially, but also circulation difficulties and um, nerve impairment and that type of thing are particularly at risk because if they get injured, they may not know that they're injured. So inspection becomes very, very important. So slipper socks are not enough. When the patient's feet hit the floor, we're going to talk about their shoes. And we're going to learn the rest of the steps for shoe rules in just a little bit. And then every skill ends the same way. They all end the same, they all begin the same way, they all end the same way. So we have the closing and there's six main C's to the closing. The first four, we don't care about the order. Anybody know what those four are? Yeah. Call out. Curtain. Curtain. Okay. Comfort, curtain, call light, clean environment. Doesn't matter how you do it. I don't care. Nobody cares. Just make sure you get all four done. So ask them if they're comfortable. We're going to offer a magazine too because that's emotional comfort. Um, give them their call light. And for the test, you actually have to put the call light in their hand. Okay. Um, make sure the environment is clean. And one of the, the things that messes most students up with clean environment is they don't look at the table to see if the chucks is still there. Remember, we used a barrier on the table. Yeah. And at the end of the skill, you're just so excited about ending the skill and you just want it done that you'll forget to look to see, did I take care of that? Okay, so clean environment. Take that minute to look around and make sure everything looks good. Always leave your patient looking better than you found them. It's a good rule. Um, and then you're going to open the curtain. Well, now that we've touched the curtain and we're done, you know, we've got all these patient cooties on us because we've worked with the patient. What do we want to do? Wash our hands. Wash our hands. So we're going to wash all the patient's cooties off. Do we want to go back to the patient after that? No. Why? Re cootied up. <laughs> yep. More cooties. So make sure you're all done before you go wash your hands. And then after you wash your hands, if you need to document. Remember, there's four documentation skills. You will get one of them. If you need to document, you're going to do it after you wash your hands. And then what are you going to do after that? Wash your hands again. All right, so look at everything that you guys have learned. This is the test. Everything up there is the test. And you guys have got it. <laughs> when our nerves get frazzled, we well, we're now at the halfway point. Yeah. Well, we're half half done. Um, Excuse me. Uh, the exam is only in English. The the skills exam mm -hmm. only in English. There. The written. Mm -hmm. Um, you can take in Spanish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the written test um, you can take in Spanish. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any questions on what we've reviewed? So we're at the halfway point, and we have four skills to learn today. But after today is done, we only have six skills left. And most of those are variations of things that we've already learned. So this actually is pretty easy on us. 
um, from this point, after today, from this point on. You will get practice time in class today. Up till now, you haven't had much practice time. I mean, we practice blood pressure a little bit. Mm -hmm. We practice pulse on each other. But most of the skills, we haven't had a chance to practice. And that's because I needed to get all of this behind us before I give you practice time. So there's a lot I needed to go over. Well, today at the end of class, you're going to have about 30 to 45 minutes of practice, depending on technology. Um, on Wednesday, you're going to have about an hour of practice time. Next Monday, you're going to have about an hour and a half. So as we get further into the program, you get more and more practice time built into the program. Remember that you still have this room available on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1.30 until 4 after graduation as well, for a month after graduation. Make sure that you're in uniform with your ID badge and that you're um, only in here with other students. Don't bring family, friends, neighbors, outsiders. Okay. <clears throat> so it's a good idea. This is about the time that I tell you guys it's a good idea to make friends, exchange phone numbers, or form a Facebook group or whatever you need to do to coordinate with somebody else to come in and practice. I have a question. Uh, say afterwards, uh, some of like I can't, I have to wait for so some people make the exam before me. Can I, when you're redoing the lives again, can I, because I don't want to forget, can I switch? Well, you have access to the online program. Yes. And in the online program, I have lessons, uh, lectures in there. So in here, it's live and you won't, I, I actually will take these down. Okay. Um, I usually leave them up a week. The, I left the first week up. It's still up, but it'll go down today. Okay. Um, I usually leave the live lectures up a week. Um, what if I need but to in, key points in the course, I actually have already done all this for you. So, um, for instance, when we in here live, we talked about range of motion, why we do it. You guys remember why we do range of motion? Okay, so to maintain a current level of function. But I gave you a whole lecture on that, right? I told you about Frank, who hurt himself yeah. in tennis. We talked about physical therapy versus CNA. We talked about all of that. Well, in the online program, I have that lecture already embedded. Yeah, okay. Is it is it still like how you should have it in bed? Well, Everything, yeah. It's so at, that visual oh yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. The online program is even better than what you get in here. I hate to say it that way, but it is. Because yeah, you can see everything. Um but there's activities that you do that help you maintain that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Hearing something, you'll hear about half of what you hear, or you'll, you'll remember about half of what you hear and about a quarter of what you see. But you remember about 80% of what you do. Yeah. So what I did in the online program is in the lesson, you have the video where I talk about it, just like in here, we talk about the skill. I introduce it, I tell you the important points. And then you have a video where I show you the skill. And you've seen those videos, I've shown them in here. And then you have an activity where you actually have to choose the supplies. You have to put the steps in order. You have to, you have to do something to help cement that in. And there's a, just like in here, there's a lot of repetition in there. So the online program, I think, is a little bit better just because it makes you do something. Okay. So that's why I like to marry what you have in here, the live, with the online. That's why I give you that online for free. 
because if you come in here, you listen to the lectures, you practice during practice time, that's all great. But if you go home and do that online program, those same lessons in the online program, it will just click for you and it becomes like effortless. Okay. Because remember, you're going to learn more by doing than you will by watching and listening. And that's why I like that online program. It took me about two years to build it. Oh, wow. It's very, very interactive, very uh, immersive. Mm -hmm. And I'm adding to it all the time. And how long do we have access to that? Uh, a year. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to page 55. You guys all have to bear with me. I got to do this manually because my little clicker thing doesn't want to work. Okay, so those of you who are playing along at home, this is going to be on page 55 of your book. And this is the page. So this is performed passive range of motion to elbow and wrist. We have heard of this before. We learned passive range of motion of the shoulder already. So this is a very similar skill. It's just on the elbow and wrist this time. So passive means that we're doing the work. The patient is passively involved. We're going to do the work here. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see some test info here. It tells us that somebody with our level of experience should be able to do this skill within four minutes. So that's with an opening, the skill, and closing. It's super, super quick. Um, it tells us that another testing student is going to be the patient. So that means you guys might be the patient for this. Remember that when you're the patient, you're going to get a script. You're going to be pleasant and cooperative. That person's going to be positioned in bed and the charting isn't required. So let's take a closer look at the skills page. I'm sorry, the um, care plan here. So this is the care plan. It says provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's right elbow and right wrist. Flexion, extension. So if you remember what we learned last week was flexion, extension is up, down. Flexion extension is up, down. So we're going to um, move the right elbow up, down. We're going to move the right wrist up, down. If we get pain, we don't go to the point of pain on the next repetition. So if I move the wrist forward to here and the patient grimaces or says, ow, or stiffens up, or I get resistance or anything like that, I'm going to go back and the next one will go below the point of pain. But who needs to know there was pain? The nurse. We're not going to tell the patient, oh, no pain, no gain. Push through it. Almost done. Those are not our statements. That's not us. Okay, so we go below the point of pain. Tells us to provide three repetitions of each exercise and the resident is not able to help with the exercises. So this is what this is going to look like. Flexion extension looks like the person's making a muscle. So we're curling the forearm up to the shoulder and then back down to the bed, just like this, three times. Remember that the elbow always needs to be supported either on the bed or by your hand but don't hold the arm up out midair and try to do something like this. The elbow always needs to be supported. So that's the flexion extension of the elbow and then flexion extension of the wrist looks like this. Loose fist, forward and back, like you're revving a motorcycle. Okay. Now, if you notice, I gave you guys some descriptions of these exercises that made you um, easily understand what we were doing. Making a muscle, revving a motorcycle. 
when I'm doing this on patients, I want to use those same descriptions so that they know what I'm doing with their body. So I'm going to tell them, all right, Mr. Jones, I'm going to bend your um, arm up like you're making a muscle and back down to the bed. We'll do this three times. Okay, we're going to bend your wrist forward like you're revving a motorcycle and then back. You'll feel a stretch three times. Okay. So I'm going to use those same descriptors so that the patient understands what I'm doing with their body. Good? Okay. Easy peasy. All right, so one thing I wanna go over with you really quickly, and this is something we haven't talked about. So we've talked about these banners on the back. We've gone over almost all of them. We still have to finish up shoe rules later today. And those are principles that are covered with absolutely every skill, right? So the opening is the same, barrier is the same, gloves are the same, uh, washing rules are the same. Doesn't matter whether you're washing a hand, a foot, or any other body part, washing rules are always the same. So these are principles that are commonly repeated throughout multiple skills. But when we get to the skill, there's some things that we have to remember that's specific to that skill, okay? Specific to that skill. And that's what we're seeing here. These are skills specific for range of motion. So if we're doing any range of motion, we need to lift extremities from below with a flat palm. Remember, we're not the claw machine at Walmart. We don't grasp. We want two points of support near the joints. Elbows always have to be supported either on the bed or by your hand. As long as the elbows on the bed, that is one point of support. Okay. We're going to move slowly and smoothly and we have to return all the way to the start position. So if I'm doing range of motion, flexion, extension on the elbow, if I come up and then go to here, this is not range of motion got to go all the way back to start for it to count. Up and all the way back for two. Up and all the way back for three. And then our three motions, flexion extension is up down, abduction, adduction is side to side, and rotation is around. Okay. So does this remind you about range of motion? Is this a good, good reminder? All right, so let me show you this skill. And I apologize, guys, I do not have the overhead view, but I do have. Okay, so let me get a volunteer, somebody come lay down on this bed for me. Lay down. Okay, if I was unsure which um, arm I was supposed to exercise, what, what would I just like guess? Check the care plan. When can you check the care plan? Anytime. So if I get done with my opening and I've washed my hands and I cannot remember which side I should do, then I can go check that care plan again. They don't expect you to memorize it, but I know that this is going to be done on the right. Okay. So here we go. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I need to do some range of motion on your, I'm sorry, I'm Patty, your CNA today. I need to do some range of motion on your right elbow and wrist. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies. I'll be right back. And for the sake of today, uh, we're going to simulate hand washing. So I have clean hands. I've washed my hands. All right, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as we do this, okay? First thing I'm going to do is bend your arm up and then back down to the bed like you're making a muscle. So I'm going to bend your hand to your shoulders. So turn palm up. We're going to go up and all the way back down. Feel okay? Any pain? 
up, all the way back down. Notice that the bed is supporting the elbow and I'm supporting the wrist. Two points. Up and all the way back down. Good. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the wrist. I'm going to make a loose fist and I'm going to bend your hand forward and back like you're revving a motorcycle. I'll do the work. Okay, so forward and back. Feel okay? Forward and back. Good. One more. Forward and back. Good. Any uh, pain or discomfort? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No. Would you like a magazine before I go? No, thank you. Okay, here's the call light. We're going to put that in your hand. If you need anything at all, let me know. Environment is clean. Open the curtain. I've washed my hands. I'll think about my steps, make any corrections. My skill is done. Thank you. That did not take four minutes. <laughs> maybe two. Mm -hmm. So what I want to get across to you, this is why I keep saying this, what I want to get across to you when I'm talking about this is that um, during the test, you're going to be tempted to rush. You're stressed, you're being watched, you're nervous, you want the test over. So your first instinct is just to rush and get it all done. And, and you're afraid of running out of time. Don't. You need to take a breath, calm yourself down, and know that you've got way more time than you actually need. So don't rush through it. Because when you rush, you forget things. You've got way more time than you need. Remember that this is based, the timing is based on somebody with your level of experience. None. <laughs> All right. Any questions? No. All right. So I want to talk real quick about bed position. This is on page 104. I have a video on this in the animated video series if you want to watch it, but the thing that I want to um, talk to you guys about is beds have three different positions, and this gets confusing for students sometimes when we're talking about um, when we're talking about bed position. Most of us know that the head of the bed can go up. Almost everybody knows that that is, a, you know, something that we can do in hospital beds. It's now something you could do in like regular beds. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they now have, you know, regular beds you can buy for your house. And I want to get one of those. Those are pretty cool, right? Um, so we're all familiar with head of the bed. Head of the bed at the beginning of the skill is adjusted for safety. So things like mouth care. You don't want to brush somebody's feet if they're laying down or denture care, which we're going to learn in a minute, or even um, feeding. You don't want to feed somebody who's not sitting up. So we're going to adjust the head of the bed for safety as we do these skills. At the end of the skill, it's up to the patient what they want. They may want to stay sitting up to do a crossword puzzle or watch TV. They may want to recline a little bit to get more comfortable. They may want to lay back down and take a nap. That would be me, right? <laughs> Um, but the head of the bed is whatever the patient wants at the end of the skill. Beginning of the skill, it's not up to the patient. End of the skill, it is. Now, a lesser known adjustment is the foot of the bed. You can raise the foot of the bed to get the legs elevated. It also kind of creates a little pocket so the patients don't slide to the end of the bed if the head of the bed is up. But the foot of the bed can be adjusted. But a less known adjustment is the entire bed. Now, some beds, see this thing is finicky. Yeah, technology. Oh, okay. Well, it's not that uh, batteries are dead. Okay. So the entire bed can also be adjusted. Older beds like this have a crank at the bottom. 
You see that crank? Yeah. Those people at home can't see it. Oh. But this is a crank that you actually have to put some elbow grease in and actually crank it, and it'll raise the entire bed up. The hospital beds over there, they have um, a button that you press to raise the entire bed up. I showed you that last week. But if you raise the bed to make it comfortable, there's no skill where you have to raise the bed. None. None. That is all for you. For your comfort. So if you watched me do that particular skill, the last skill, range of motion, elbow and wrist, you notice I had to bend a little bit to move the, the arm up and down. I could have raised that bed up to a comfortable working height for me. It's not required, but I could have if I wanted to be more comfortable and that's okay. But if you raise the bed up for any reason, I'm talking about the entire bed, you have to lower it to the lowest point at the end of the scale. Now, where some people get this wrong is they lower it a little bit to where it looks okay, that is not what you're graded on. You're graded on lowering it to the lowest possible setting. So it's really, really important that you understand that if you raise the bed up, you gotta keep pushing that button to get that bed low and keep pushing it so they know it's the lowest possible setting, okay? Because that's where the patient expects that floor to be. Good, make sense? Mm -hmm. But you don't have to raise the bed for any skill. Head of the bed, you have to raise the head of bed for certain skills, but at the end of the skill is patient preference. Good? Okay, so let's move on to the next skill. Okay, pictures. So go to page 67 for me. In most settings, patients that have dentures. Um, are usually going to be cleaning them using fizzy tablets in a cup. That's like the preferred way of cleaning dentures. And the reason for that is toothpaste is abrasive. It it's, um, can actually scratch the dentures. And if you scratch them, causing little micro cracks to form, that's warm, dark, definitely moist. And we know there's bacteria in the mouth. So it just gives those bacteria a nice cozy place to hang out. So most people that create dentures tell, you know, if you go get dentures, they'll tell you just clean them with uh, the fizzy tablets and take a soft brush and, you know, clean off any uh, food particles that remain. But some will still need to be cleaned with toothpaste and a toothbrush. How would we know the difference? How do we care know plan. what to do? Care plan. The care plan. So we want to look at the care plan if our patient has dentures and find out how often we should be cleaning them and the preferred method of cleaning, either fizzy tablets or toothpaste and toothbrush or toothpaste and denture brush. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, water for dentures should always be cool, not hot. There's a saying in healthcare, heat coagulates proteins, which means absolutely nothing to you. <laughs> I get that. But what that means is that the hotter something is, the stickier it becomes. So if we're using hot water to clean dentures, it's actually going to make the proteins, there's proteins in your uh, saliva, there's proteins in foods, makes those proteins stickier and harder to remove. Okay, so cool water. Dentures always have to be stored in water. They can't be stored like out on a table or something because dentures, if they aren't wet, they tend to dry out 
and become brittle, more likely to break. So dentures always have to be in liquid, whether it's in the mouth or in a cup, they have to be stored in liquid. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. There are two different types of dentures that I want to talk about. There's full plates, which is what you see here. That's what we're most familiar with. It replaces all of the teeth on either the upper or the lower. But if somebody still has some healthy teeth in their mouth, we don't generally pull healthy ones. We will pull the ones that need to be removed, and then we're going to give them a um, partial or a incomplete denture that's gonna fit around the teeth that remain. So full plates and partials are both cleaned the same way, but you need to be aware that there are two different types of dentures. Let me show you what these look like. Cameras, okay. <laughs> okay. So you can handle denture cups, that's fine. But I don't want to reach in and handle dentures without gloves. So denture cups, you can take over to the sink without gloves, that's fine. But once you are going to start working with the dentures themselves, we need to have some gloves on. So this is a full plate, and these are real dentures. They've never really been used in anybody's mouth, um, but this is a full plate. That's what it looks like. And if you notice, there's a, a groove here. That's what fits over the gums. That's going to be important in a minute. But this is a top plate because it um, has a palate, right? This fits up on the roof of the mouth. This is a top plate. It looks a little different than a bottom plate. Bottom plates don't have the middle filled in because we have to have room for the tongue. So bottom plate, top plate. This is a partial. You can see that there's cutouts for the patient's natural teeth. What remains are some hooks and loops to fit around the teeth to kind of hold them in place. Top plates often need denture paste to be held in place. Bottom sometimes will, sometimes won't, kind of patient preference. When we're working with dentures, it's important to remember that we have to clean the dentures, but we also have to clean the mouth those dentures came out of. Because if it's held in with paste, that paste is going to stick to the gums and hold in food particles. As those food particles decay, they can injure the gums. So denture care is comprised of cleaning the dentures and the mouth those dentures came out of. Good. Okay. So we're going to use two new supplies. This is a denture brush. It has a small end, narrow end, and it has a larger end. This looks like a toothbrush. So we're gonna use this on the teeth part of the dentures. This is smaller, it's gonna fit in that channel. Remember that channel I just pointed out where the gums, that fits over the gums? That's what this fits in. And it's smaller specifically to get into that channel and get all of that denture paste and food particles out. This is gonna be reused. It just gets cleaned like you clean toothbrush, you know, and then you'll reuse it. This is what we often clean the patient's mouth with. And that's because this is called a toothette or an oral swab. You'll hear it called, some places call them dent tips as well. Um, but it's basically a spongy, solid surface. Looks like a lollipop. It does not taste like one. 
they're mint flavored, but they're not a very good mint flavored. But we use this, you can use a soft toothbrush on gums. There's no problem with that. But toothpaste, or I'm sorry, denture paste is going to kind of get all caught up in those bristles. And you're not at a sink where you can clean that brush frequently. So with all of that denture paste and stuff getting in the bristles, you're just not going to get a very good clean. That's why this is preferred because it has solid surfaces. It allows us to swipe that denture paste and food particles off of the gums. And it works a little bit better. And then it's disposable. You just get rid of it after you use it. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So for denture care, we've got dentures that are in a cup. At the beginning of the scale, we're going to take it over to the sink. You can touch the cup. It's no problem. And we're going to clean the dentures that are in the cup, and then we're going to store it in cool, clean water after we're done cleaning. And then we're going to clean the mouth those dentures came out of using a toothette. The denture brush is going to be cleaned and saved. The toothette is going to be disposed of after we use it. Good. And I have dentures here for you guys to practice with. So let's look at the book. So for those of you at home that are playing along, this is on page 68 of your skills book. And this is what our page looks like. This has a lot of supplies. You need to learn those supplies, guys. But let's look at the bottom here. You'll see that it, according to the test, this should take somebody with your level of experience about 13 minutes to complete. It's a long time. That is a really long time. It doesn't take 13 minutes but you have that long to do this, okay? But if you look right next to that, it says the um, person you're gonna be doing this on is another testing student. That could be you. Now that doesn't mean you're gonna have to go out and get dentures before the test. What that means is the patient's going to be sitting at an overbed table. The dentures are already in the denture cup. You're responsible for cleaning those dentures and storing them back in the cup for future use. And then cleaning them out, those dentures came out of. Okay. This person is sitting in a chair. And let's take a look at the care plan. So this care plan tells us a resident with dentures is sitting at an overbed table with their dentures in a denture cup. The resident's denture needs to be brushed with toothpaste and the resident needs mouth care. The denture is stored in a denture cup after cleaning. So we're not gonna to try to put this in somebody's mouth. And then it says the resident is not able to provide, provide their own mouth or denture care. Um, when we're talking about dentures, so we've taken the, this denture cup over to the sink. And we clean the dentures, we rinse the cup out, got some clean water in it, put the dentures back in. That cup is wet. So if we come over here and put that wet cup on here, what's going to happen to this table? Yeah, it's going to get wet. It's probably going to develop a ring around it. You know, uh, it'll warp the, the material. So anytime that we have a wet cup, we want to put any some sort of a um, barrier underneath it, like a coaster. So you'll see that in this skill. You're actually going to see me put a paper towel under the cup as I set it on the overbed table for later use. Good. Any questions on that? Well, you could, but I'm leaving it there. Oh, and okay. trucks are really big, and they're probably going to get in the way. All I want is something to get the moisture, you know, Oh. Grab the moisture so it doesn't warp the material. Okay. Okay. As CNAs, we do not put dentures in. We do not take them out. The patient has to be able to do that on their own. 
You don't put dentures in, you don't take them out. Now there's two really good reasons for this. If I have dentures, especially top dentures, if I have dentures in and I want to take my top plate out, I've got to put my fingers way in my mouth, but way back here. And I've got to pop those dentures off. So I got to get way up at the top and push down and forward to get that plate out. Make sense? That's okay because my top jaw is attached to my skull. But if I want to get bottom dentures out, I've got to put my fingers way back in to this joint back here, get underneath and pop up and forward. Now, if I'm doing that on me, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on my lower jaw. But if I'm doing that on you, these knuckles are going to press down on that lower jaw to pop the plate up. And that lower jaw can be dislocated with too much pressure. You guys see how that could happen? Mm -hmm. So CNAs do not take dentures out. And we don't put dentures in because when you put dentures in, the patient's going to bite down reflexively to seat those dentures. And if your fingers are in the way, you're going to get bit. And they're not going to mean to do it. It's a reflex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't put dentures in. We don't take dentures out. Not our job. If the patient can't take care of that themselves, then we don't use dentures. We just puree their food. Chop it up really fine. So they're on a mechanical soft or pureed diet. Make sense? All right, so that's not an issue for this skill because it says that um, the dentures are already in a denture cup and we're gonna store it in a denture cup after cleaning. So that's already been addressed by our care plan. So let's look at the skill specific steps for this. So when we're cleaning the, um, the dentures and we're over at the sink, I'm gonna put a washcloth in the bottom of that sink because if I happen to drop the dentures, I don't want them to hit the sink and break. If I put a washcloth in the bottom of the sink, it makes a softer surface. So if they fall, they're less likely to break. Now, if I can get that washcloth over the drain, that's even better because it allows the water to pool up and that will keep the denture from hitting the bottom of the sink. So we're gonna put a washcloth in the bottom of the sink. We're gonna use cool water. We talked about that. Dentures always have to be stored in water and we're going to use a barrier to keep that cup from warping our surfaces for mouth care our patient has to be sitting fully upright that makes sense we're going to protect the clothing we're going to brush all surfaces in the tongue this time with a tooth at we're going to wet all brushes before applying toothpaste so denture brush gets wet before we put toothpaste on it tooth at gets wet before we put toothpaste on it to clean the mouth we're going to allow the patient to rinse and spit, and we always leave a patient's face and clothing dry. Good. Easy peasy, right? All right. So here are our um, puzzle pieces. Of course, skill rules apply. We're gonna follow the care plan. We're gonna do our opening. We need a barrier for our supplies. We're gonna evaluate gloves. I'm gonna be touching ooey gooey, so I need gloves. Um, we talked about skill specific steps we have to remember. Linen rules. I'm going to be using a towel and a washcloth. So if I take too many, what do I have to do? Discard them. Discard them. Don't hold anything up next to your uniform. We're going to clean our basin the same way we clean everything else. And then we're going to do our closing. So nothing really here that's unusual for us. We already know all of these steps. Let's just put them together into a skill. So let me show you this um, video. I'm going to show you the video because it has good close ups, especially at the sink. And sadly, my sink camera is not working at the moment.
I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Wonderful. I need to do denture care on you. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to take your dentures to the sink. I'm going to close the privacy curtain and wash my hands. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones. I'm going to place a barrier on the table. So we have a clean area to place the clean supplies. And then I'll gather the supplies that we need. We'll need a cup of water, a toothpick, a denture brush, toothpaste, a basin, a washcloth and a towel, and two sets of gloves. Okay, we're going to get the denture brush ready for use, so I'll wet it and apply a little bit of toothpaste to both sides. We'll allow the basin to hold that denture brush until we're ready to use it. I'll be right back, Mr. Jones. I'm going to go clean your dentures. Okay. You have to put the denture brush in the base and you can't just lay it on the side of the sink because the sink is not considered clean. That's why that basin is there, is to hold that brush. Make sure you keep good hold over those dentures though. Don't let them fall. Okay, Mr. Jess, I'm just going to set your dentures over here so that you have them. You should need them later. Okay. I'll place the denture brush on the barrier and now we'll remove these gloves. We'll throw those away. Do you mind if I place a towel over your chest? Of course. This will help keep your clothing clean. Thank you. We're going to prepare for the mouth care portion of this skill. We'll take the toothpaste and wet it. Apply a little bit of toothpaste to one area of the toothpaste and apply gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to brush all surfaces of your teeth now. So in a moment, I'll need you to open your mouth wide 
so that I can reach the back teeth. Okay. Okay, can you open your mouth? Thank you. I'm gonna brush the back on the bottom and on the top, both sides. Okay, can you bring your teeth together, please? Thank you very much. We're gonna throw the tooth out of weight. And would you like to rinse? Good. Would you like another rinse? Yes, please. Another rinse? No, thank you. Okay. I'm going to remove your towel and we'll place this in dirty linen. We'll throw away the disposables. And now I'm going to clean your basin. I'll be right back. Okay. I'll place the denture brush and the toothpaste in the basin and open the drawer with the paper towel to store the basin and other supplies. I'll remove the barrier from the table and we'll throw this away as well. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Can I get you a magazine? No, thank you. Is there anything else that you need? No, thank you. Your call light's right there. If you should need anything, just let me know. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions? I don't know, maybe I have to walk. It looked like at one point, uh, I didn't have a question, you opened the sink, you had you touched with the gloves in the sink, then you put your hands inside and you rubbed it. Is that okay? You know what I mean? It's okay. Uh, you, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you're, you're going to notice like, any little thing off, is that okay? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's okay. I because remember, in a clinical setting, you're going to be disinfecting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make, yeah. make sure. But here, we don't, because they don't know who for the test is, has um, asthma or allergies. Yeah. And if you use a disinfectant spray, it can aggravate somebody. Oh, okay. So they don't disinfect. No. They, or they don't have you disinfect. No, I was wondering what is when you touch the, the faucet. The faucet, you put the glove in there, you know, you rinse it later on. You're gonna, you know, is that good enough? Yes. Okay. Yes. That is perfectly okay. My mom would be the most people. No, <laughs> she's one of those people. So they need you to have a basic understanding of infection control, not, they aren't nitpicky okay. on infection control. Okay. You can always use a paper towel to turn the faucet on. There's no problem with that. Any other questions? No? Let's go ahead and take a break. Come back at 20 till. I'll give you 17 minutes. Okay. That way you can go grab a drink. Is it Apple or Android? Hey. USB-C? Yeah, we do. Okay. Well, um, 
My computer is probably dead because it wasn't plugged in. I knew I had it. This way, it was just going down the left side. Oh, yeah, that would be a vapor. Yeah, that yeah. might actually work. Yeah. Yeah. See it with the same way. <laughs> because, um, yeah, there's a slow down on the laptop. Yeah. Plug it in over there. Well, just because my right my uh, computer is dead. Mm -hmm. um, uh, last time we discussed that, I was going to buy the book, so I'm just going to pay them or just go pay you directly. Just go pay them. Okay. Yeah, Jacob, we have to prepare right. that. No problem. So I have a brain right leg that people. Oh, no, my house. <laughs> no worries. See, <laughs> my favorite too. I saw it. You had the same kind. Yeah, of I, I had the same one. Yeah, I love the elf ones. I like that flavor too. Mm -hmm. I don't actually I kill the spice thing. <laughs> I don't know. I smoke still, but I'm trying to quit. So this is this is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. I hate the smell in my bedroom. I don't like people like smoking in bedroom. I can't do that. So I vape. I can't, you know, even when I lately been smoking in the house, the kitchen, it, but it's me, you know. But when after a while, there's the smell. I can't. Yeah, I don't like when it does my teeth or nails and like. Yeah. So I, I like the puff bars. Yeah, they're, 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 you know, I'm still trying to quit smoking. I mean, I still smoke this car, but listen. This helps a lot versus just always I smoke more. Just leave it down, putting it on top of your bag or something. Put the put on my chair. Well, my yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Look what I got for her. I can't see it. Hold on. No, I can't see anything. It's just black. Okay. 
Does she like it? Um, how to convince her Yeah. Um, my phone might be dead by the time. I don't know, I gotta try this in my mind. Um, seventeen years. Why is your camera off? Oh, oh no, it's working. Yeah. No, eso fue, eso fue de yo ahí. Está bien. ¿Qué le dijeron a las niñas ahí? A las niñas, ¿qué le dijeron? Where did you go? Where did you go? Where did you go? No way, no way. Oh. Yeah, I'm on the
Y cosas de ella, y cosas de su hijo. Porque es una cosa. Sí. Y a pedir la lechuza, a pedir la lechuza en seguida. Y yo le estaba, yo le estaba diciendo a tu mamá, Shelly, que ahí yo mandé también como una gelatina, porque me dijo no había querido comer nada. Pero a ver si con la gelatina quiere comerse la quesito, adentro de las galletitas de, de soda. Yo le eché, yo le eché también como las estrellitas esas que a él le gustan, como los cerealitos de las estrellitas. Conté el tomo del antibiótico, pero también le gusta con el estómago vacío. Y el antibiótico también es fuerte y el marido se puede comer el guiso. Está bien, está bien. Está bien. Ah, está bien. Ah, está bien. Entonces, anoche, ayer por la tarde, yo probé con un arroz, frijoles, con copita, con le hice hasta cobito y todo. No quise, no me comieron nada de noche. Está bien, Saiga. Ay, gracias. Vamos a ir a la casa. Vamos a ir a la casa. Vamos a ir a la casa. Yeah. Mommy, tell him, did you try it? You should have told him it was like broken or something. You always try to use glue, and if it's out, you need to use burn. Well, your pet died and you had to get a charger to charge it. Your pet died, I had to get a charger to charge it. And then you
not sure how, but the mic is, because I have the mic on me, but somehow it's picking up. So be careful about your conversations. Because <laughs> you're, until I can figure that out, you're being broadcast. <laughs> Telling them somehow the mic is picking up on the conversation. Oh, geez, okay. Okay. I wash my hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I'm okay with all that wind the other day. So. Yeah. Yeah. It'll go away. It'll go away. Right. Just some branches around the property. Yeah. Yeah, mine too. It's just like five barrels of branches. Mm. Mm -hmm. A whining barrel compared to what could have been. Mm -hmm. Did you see that in the Fort Lauderdale? Fort Myers? Fort, yeah, Fort Myers. Actually, my brother has a friend that has lived on Canada already. He's like, from Canada. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's horrible. They weren't there, though, but they were they're up in Illinois. Um, so last, usually October, they come down. But they won't even know until. You know, so I can see what she wants to. Yeah, it's heartbreaking to see the devastation down there. I'm very, very glad that, you know, we were spared the brunt of it, but. Yeah, I think, I forget, like I had my dad over, he's got dementia, and I was thinking to myself, he's 93. Like, what a. What a asshole! What can we deal with him <laughs> through that? You know, yeah. <laughs> that would be selfish, but well, God bless you. So made it in '93. Yeah, yeah, that's a blessing. It's a, it's a little hard. I mean, obviously, I don't know how bad it is. It's a blessing to be at that age still. I mean, he still lives on his own, but I go. I like. I go there every day. Oh wow! You know. I don't know how much longer. They have it all. 
And if he can live on his own, that's that's incredible. Very good. Okay, so let's go to page 43 and talk about energy conservation. Forty-three. We need to. We're we're getting ready to learn ambulate with a gate belt, and part of learning this is understanding why we would assist somebody um, with walking. And I want to kind of focus on aging, but there's going to be other situations that we would help somebody with walking, using the process and things like that. But I want to start with aging. Have you guys ever seen a two year old? Oh, yeah. I love two year olds. Man, they are so much fun. They bounce up and down for no reason. I mean, just because they have excess energy, they will literally bounce. <laughs> when was the last time you bounced? <laughs> yeah, it's been a while, right? You don't have <laughs> excess energy. And what we need to understand is your energy levels peak around two ish. <laughs> When your energy levels, it's all downhill from there. Um, you know, two-year-olds have like tons and tons and tons of energy. They will just go and go and go and go. I would love to bottle that. If I could, if I could bottle that and sell it, I'd make a fortune because I've got all kinds of energy. But that energy level doesn't maintain throughout your lifespan. It actually starts to decrease shortly after that. Let's talk about a 10 year old. 10 year olds have tons of energy. I mean, they can go and go and go and go and go and, um, you know, play video games and skateboard and have sleepovers. And I mean, they, they just have all kinds of energy. But you put a 10 year old in charge of a two year old for one afternoon. Who wins? Two year old. Two year old every time. So that tells you that your energy level has decreased in that, in that time span. Let's go out to 22. Now, 22 year olds still have tons of energy. You shop to your drop, go out at night looking fabulous, stay out all night, you know, still tons of energy. But that 22 year old does not have the same energy they had with when they were 10. Now, go out to 42. Now, 42 year olds still have tons of energy. They can shop till they drop, but that's at like three, and we're not going out tonight. <laughs> But energy levels decline even further after that. Think about a 62-year-old. 62-year-olds are starting to think about retirement because it's really hard to keep up with daily activities, you know, working and, and uh, cleaning the house and taking care of grandkids and, you know, all the stuff that you got to do, something's got to go. There's just not enough energy in the day for that. So you start thinking about retirement. Might put your feet up for 10 minutes before you go make dinner. Daily household chores get a little bit harder to do because you simply don't have the stamina that you used to. Now let's go out to 82. What do you think energy levels are going to be like at 82? Yeah, they're going to decrease significantly. Now understand that this is average. I know that there are people in their 90s out there that can run circles around a 40-year-old. I know that. I get it. I'm not talking about outliers. I'm just talking about in general, your energy levels decrease throughout your lifespan. And we need to keep this in mind because we're going to be caring for elderly patients. And it's really, really easy to think that they have the same energy level that you do. We don't really think about this decline in energy levels. But just like you trying to explain to a two-year-old that you don't have the energy to do what they want you to do, that elderly person can't get you to understand their lack of energy. And this comes up a lot, a lot. Um, you'll go to give an elderly person a shower. All right, Martha, it's time for your shower. And she says, oh, no, honey, I don't have energy for that today. You're like, what do you mean you don't have energy? All you have to do is sit there. I do all the work. What do you mean you don't have energy? But just simply getting undressed, sitting there through the ordeal, getting dried off, 
getting redressed. Those, are, those things take energy. And if you're already out of energy, that can seem like a momentous activity. Not to you, because you've got more energy than they do. So it's really hard for us to sometimes understand where our patients are coming from. It's hard to relate because that two-year-old can't relate to us. So when your patient says, I don't have the energy, believe them. They, they, they don't have the energy. We have to, you know, we have to take what they say. Sometimes it might be better to rearrange our schedule so that we can attack these um, activities when the patient has more energy. Some people have way more energy in the mornings. I am not that person. I am a night person. Absolutely. I like my showers in the morning because that's how I wake up. But as I get older, my showers will probably move to evening when I have naturally more energy. We have day people in here, people that like to get up and watch the sun come up. That is not me. We have afternoon people that, you know, function really well in the afternoon. They don't do early mornings well. They don't do late nights well, but afternoon, they're your person, right? And then we've got people who are night <laughs> people who start to come alive at four or five in the afternoon. Everybody has their normal rhythm. And sometimes if we can find out what our patient's normal rhythm is and schedule activities when they are have their most energy, we can get more done. Does that make sense? Instead of trying to get our patients to follow our facility schedule, sometimes it's easier and more advantageous. You can get the patients cooperative more if you rearrange the facility schedule to meet the needs of the patients. Good. So why do I even care about all this? I mean, what does it really matter? Well, old people, they have nothing to do and all day to do it. I mean, why do we even have to talk about this energy stuff? Well, if we only have this much energy to get through the day, if that's it, that's all we've got. What kind of things are gonna take that energy? What kind of things do you do that take energy? Physical activity. Okay, so physical activity. Okay, so dressing, bathing, grooming, eating. Have you ever been too tired to eat? If you've been too tired to do something, you know it takes energy. So if you've ever been too tired to eat, you know eating takes energy. So if our patients aren't eating well because they're out of energy, what's going to happen to, to tomorrow's energy? Even less. And this is how we end up with a downward spiral. So eating takes energy. What about talking? Do you think talking takes energy? Oh, yeah. I have been too tired of talking. Mondays and Wednesday afternoons when I get home, because I talk nonstop for four hours, and then I go into the store, and I work in there until closing time. So by the time I get home on Mondays and Wednesdays, I don't want to talk. I'm just done. I'm tired. So talking takes energy, but humans are social creatures and you rely on socialization to help you work out problems, to help you organize your thoughts, to help you deal with emotions. Talking is a huge part of the human experience. So if we have a situation where we don't have much energy and we're using it all up and then we have no energy left to talk with, we can end up with some depression, yeah. some withdrawal, um, difficulty relating to others, maybe a decreased appetite because they're not working through their feelings. You could end up with some aggression and anger issues. I mean, there's a lot of things that go along with that. So we need to understand that all of these things take energy. And also with their, their body functions in general, they wouldn't have the been I can eat breast and stuff. They won't even have the energy to physically get up, move, and then that could force right. the force range of motion as well as more stiff, not participating in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, energy plays a really, really, really big part in our daily activity. Does that make sense? 
All right, so now that we understand how important energy is and how all of the things that we do every day is going to eat at our energy, and that's all we have to work with, let's talk about the relationship between, oh, I'm sorry, energy and strength. Okay. So think of, of, you guys know what a seesaw is, a teeter totter, right? So think of energy on one side and strength on the other. And as strength decreases, energy has to increase. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I am sitting here in this chair, if I want to get up out of the chair, I simply stand up out of the chair because I have the strength to do so. It doesn't take me a lot of energy because I've got strength on my side. But as we age, our muscle mass decreases, our overall strength decreases, and getting up out of the chair becomes much more problematic because I no longer have the strength. So because I don't have strength, what do I need? Energy. So have you ever seen an old person try to get out of a chair? The rock and roll method, right? So they'll start out like this. So they're sitting in a chair and they want to get up and they start to rock because they need momentum. This is energy, people. Energy. How much do I have for the day? Okay, so energy. So I'm rocking. And when I finally get some momentum up, I'm going to start to stand. Oh, no, 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 no. Back down. Let's do it again. More energy. So I finally... How much energy did that take? A lot. a lot. Now remember, we only have a little bit of energy. And we need en energy for bathing, dressing, grooming, eating, socialization. If I'm using all of my energy just to get up out of the chair, and think about how many times you get out of the chair every day. Okay. You get up out of the chair to go to the bathroom, to groom, to get dressed, to go to meals, three of them to go to activities. I mean, you're constantly getting out of the chair. You don't realize it, but this is a huge drain of energy. So if we understand all this, we only have a little bit of energy to work with. We need energy to get through the day. This takes a lot of energy because we don't have a lot of strength. What, what's something that we can do to help our patients conserve energy by giving them some of our strength? And that's why we can help patients stand up with a gait belt because it helps conserve their strength. That makes sense? Good. So that's what this skill is about. We're going to assist our patient to stand and then we're going to be with them while they walk to um, you know, help give them some of our strength if they start to lose mobility. It also helps prevent fall. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to falls, we don't catch patients. You don't want to catch a patient. If you catch a patient, somebody's going to get hurt, probably both of you. So we don't catch a patient. But you know, there's something about this that most people don't realize. If I'm a patient, I'm just walking along, I'm not just going to walk along normally. Everything is great. Ugh. You know, it doesn't work like that. When a patient is going to fall, they give you all kinds of notification that they're about to fall. I mean, everything short of a neon sign flashing over their head. They will slow down. That's number one. They will put a hand out on the wall or they put a hand on their stomach or their head. They are telling you something is wrong here. So watch that hand, it moves. They may get a little bit wobbly. They may get pale and sweaty. All of these are signs that something is going very wrong in your patient's world. And the next thing that's gonna happen is they're going to fall. But if you can notice that, so where should your attention be when you're walking a patient? 
on them, 100%. So you should be looking for slowing down, hand movement, pale, sweaty. You should be feeling, because you're holding the gait belt, for wobbling and unsteadiness. All of those things are telling you, hey, something is going on here. Now, your first instinct is going to be to get that patient back to safety. Everybody wants to do that. Let's get them back to the, if they're not tolerating a slow walk, they're not going to tolerate a hurry. So what's going to end up happening? They're going to fall. And that's where most falls happen is because you want to get the patient back to safety, but you're thinking with your brain, not theirs. They're not going to make it. So if we can get the patient sitting on the floor, patients that sit on the floor can't fall on the floor. Falls are when injury happens. But if I'm noticing my patient get pale, sweaty, wobbly, all of these things, right? And I'm walking behind them. So my patient is somewhat in front of me. I've got my hand on the gate belt as they're walking and their feet are here, right? And I can feel something going wrong. As we're walking, my foot goes right in between theirs from behind and I pull them back onto me. Now they are leaning against me and we're going to go to the floor, okay? So as we're walking, if I feel anything, I'm going to say, stop. I'm going to help you to the floor. Plant, pull, slide. Now your patient isn't going to fall on the floor. They're safe. And we're going to get a nurse to figure out what's going on with the patient because it's not our job, right? We can get a wheelchair. We can get help. We can get anything we need from that point. But it sure beats a trip to the ER for a broken hip. Especially with sweats, you're saying it could be a sign of stroke or heart attack on the hip too as well. Uh, yeah, we don't know what's going on. Yeah, could could be anything. So we have to get the nurses. Uh, but the number one mistake that CNAs make is they try to hurry the patient back to safety. But that's the wrong answer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... When you're, so we just talked about elderly, but you know what happens when you're sick? Your body consumes more energy because it's trying to heal. It's trying to fight off whatever it is that's hurting you, whether it's an invader or an injury or whatever, your body's energy is going into that. So you're not going to have the same energy level that you had pre-sick. So gate belts to help stand might be indicated there as well. Does that make sense? Okay. If the patient is on medication that makes them wobbly and unsteady, a gate belt is a good option. So there's a lot of reasons why we would be using a gate belt, not just the elder. But if we're going to use a gate belt, we have to look excuse me, have to learn how to use it properly. So let's talk about shoe rolls. We've seen the first two. We're familiar with those. But now I want to talk to you about these because this is going to tell us how to do this skill. When you're using a gate belt, let me show you what a gate belt is. A gate belt is also called a transfer belt. This is a gate belt or a transfer belt. It's a flat canvas belt, has a metal buckle on one end, free end on the other, like any other belt. This goes around the patient's waist, not yours. And you can carry, you know, you can put it around your waist, you know, while you're carrying it around, waiting to use it, but when you go to use it, it goes around the patient's waist, not yours. It doesn't matter whether the buckle faces this way or the buckle faces this way, nobody cares. What matters is that the tag goes on the inside like every other article of clothing. So this goes around the patient's waist. I'm gonna put it on me just to show you. So this goes around the patient's waist. When you put this on, you want to keep it flat. You don't want it to twist at all. 
So you want to put this around the patient's waist so that it's flat. The free end goes through the first guard by the alligator teeth. Just like that. Goes through the first guard by the alligator teeth. And now you're going to pull this free end the way the teeth are pointing. See how all those teeth are pointing that way? We're going to pull it this way to tighten it. If I try to pull it this way, it's not going to go anywhere. This way to tighten it. But we got to make sure it's tight enough because I'm going to use this to lift my patient out of the chair. If it's too loose and you lift with the, with the belt, this is going to go underneath the breasts or underneath the arms and injure the patient, or they can slip right out of it and fall. So you need to make sure this is tight enough that it stays in place. The way that we gauge that is four fingers underneath the belt between the belt and the patient. Four fingers flat. If you can fit your fist under there, you can fit your fist under there, it's too loose. Four fingers flat is what we're looking for. And then you're going to put this free end through the second guard to lock it in place. Now this tail, as it's hanging there, if it's too long, like for little people, if it's too long, we're just going to tuck it out of the way in the belt. Get it out of the way. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So how do you know that the gate belt is snug enough? Four, four, four fingers. For the test, they need to hear it. Okay. They need to hear it, not just see it. Okay. If I am sitting in this chair, move it. Okay, you look at this. You see the line in front and the line on each side. If you look at the floor here, you'll see this chair is in a box. You see the, the lines on the floor? It's actually in a box. I could draw a box around this chair with those lines. If I am the patient sitting in this chair, I am in this box. Good. When somebody is going to lift the patient out of the chair, we need to use this box. What we used to tell people is to stand right in front of the patient, toe to toe, knee to knee. That way, their feet won't slide out. Sounds good in theory. The problem is there's a physics principle at work here. Every action has an equal reaction and opposite reaction. You guys remember hearing that in like middle school? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Okay. So if we've got a patient in this chair that's 150 pounds, and I am lifting that patient toward me, that's 150 pounds of force coming my way, momentum. So that means my body has to bend backwards with 150 pounds of force to keep you stable. That is a back injury waiting to happen. That is not good. So we shouldn't stand in front of somebody toe to toe, knee to knee, because either you're gonna get injured or you're gonna feel unsteady and that can cause both you and the patient to fall. Does that make sense? So to illustrate, if I am standing here, I've got a patient in the chair, I'm toe to toe, knee to knee, and I reach around and grab the back of the gate belt and I'm lifting them up this way, it'll throw me off balance. Now that was no weight, by the way. Okay. So if we have a patient sitting in a chair and we're not gonna stand in front of them, then how in the world are we supposed to lift them? Well, we're gonna use that box. One of my feet is gonna go perpendicular or across in front of the patient's feet. This keeps their feet from sliding up. The other foot goes parallel to the chair. I am now at the corner of a box, one foot along each side. And now I'm going to bend at the knees, not at the waist. We don't bend at the waist. You're gonna bend at the knees, reach around behind the gate belt. And on the count of three, we're gonna stand one, two, three, and then we stand. And I am steady with that because that that weight is not pushing me backwards. Is 
it's because you're, when your leg is in between their knees, that's why they won't be able to, you know, they won't be able to slide down. Is that correct? When you stand in position yourself, like if you're standing this way, now you're having your, your leg between their legs, they won't be able to slide down. Well, I don't want my leg between their legs. Okay. I'm going to put, yep. put a foot. We're going to come back to this in a second, but let me show you. It looks awkward to begin with, but when you try it, it, yeah, it, it's like, oh, that, that's, it, it actually doesn't feel awkward. So this, um, this screen will show you one foot is in front of their feet oh, wow. across. The other foot is parallel to their chair. So when you put a, where is it? So here you can see how this looks wow. with a caregiver, okay? So one foot in front of their feet, perpendicular, one foot parallel to the chair. You're gonna reach around to the side or back of the gate belt, both hands, and you're gonna lift on the count of three. Notice we're um, bent at the knees. Good. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna show you the skill in a minute, but you're going to see that it actually decreases the amount of effort required because you're standing at that oblique angle. So I really wish my little thing was working. Okay, so let's go back here. So we wanna make sure there's four feet between the gate belt and patient, and we wanna make sure the patient's feet are flat on the floor. So me, I'm short. If I sit in this chair all the way back, my feet are not flat on the floor. They just aren't long enough. Chairs are too tall for me. I think we should make lower chairs personally. So in order for me to get my feet flat on the floor, I have to scoot forward a little bit. Now, if you try to lift me to a standing position with my feet like this, I'm on my tiptoes. What's going to happen when you provide mo forward momentum? Yeah. I'm going to lose my balance. I'm going to fall. So you have to make sure the patient's feet are in fact flat on the ground. And you're going to ask them, are your feet flat on the floor or flat on the ground? You want to make sure. Okay, so in my case, I would have to scoot forward a little bit to get my feet flat on the floor. That way, when you lift me up, I've got a stable base of support. Okay, good. Okay. We always count to three before lifting. You've heard me do this a couple of times now. And that's because we're doing the skill with the patient, not on the patient. We want them to use whatever strength they have available. We don't want to do all of the work. We're just going to help them out a little. So we want to count to three so that we are in partnership here. Once we get them standing, we're going to ask how they feel. Now, I want to know that here. I'm going to ask them again as we walk, but I want to know here. Because if I get somebody standing and they go, ooh, man, the room is spinning. We aren't walking anywhere. We're going to sit back down and I'm going to go find a nurse. <laughs> We're not going to say, oh, let's walk it off and see how you feel. <laughs> you don't think. We don't think. Yeah, <laughs> CNAs do normal. Remember that. CNAs do normal. So we want to ask, how are you feeling? Are you dizzy? That type of thing. Now, once we get done with the walk, and we get back to the chair, we need that patient to know the chair is there. I don't expect them to trust me. They're not going to. My husband loves me dearly and I love him dearly. But if I tried to lower him into a chair that he didn't know was there, he would stiffen up because he doesn't want to fall. Now, he trusts me. He knows I would never do anything to hurt him. But if you don't know that something is behind you to catch you, it doesn't matter who is lowering you in the chair, you're going to stiffen up. Does that make sense? So when we're walking, so I'll be the patient for a second, we're walking back to the chair. I'm going to ask the patient when we get to the chair to turn around 
and back up so that they can feel that chair behind them. And I'm gonna ask them, can you feel the chair behind your legs? Or I might say, when you feel the chair behind your legs, say, okay. And then once they know that chair is there, then I can help lower them into it and they're not gonna fight me on it because they know there's something there to catch. Them. And I'm gonna use the same body mechanics, one foot in front, one foot beside, hold the gate belt and lower the patient into the chair. Good. When you remove the gate belt, don't pull it against the skin because that can burn. So when you remove a gate belt, you're going to see me do this in a minute. But when you have a gate belt on, we walk, we come back. I undid the gate belt. I'm not going to pull it. I'm going to loop it up and over, or I'm going to take my hand and gather it in the back. We don't pull. If you loop it up and over, make sure you have control over this. Bang. Oh, yeah. Ow. Okay. I was going to say, because your skin gets very thin out there as well and intensive. Absolutely. We talked about that with um, washing rules. Remember, we talked about this age, uh, the changes of aging and skin. Okay. So, everybody got this? She rules? Yes. Okay, so in your white skills book, go ahead and turn to page 46. And this is our skills page. Supplies, pretty easy. You just need footwear and a gate belt and they're already wearing footwear. So that's easy. But if the patient's feet hit the floor, we have to talk about their shoes. So you have to say, I see you have shoes on. Or are your shoes fastened appropriately? Something that acknowledges those shoes. Okay. Let's look at the bottom here. It says um, somebody with your level of experience should be able to do the skill within five minutes. Super quick skill. Um, this is another testing student. So you may be walking for this skill. The patient's gonna start out in a chair, so we're not transferring them out of bed or anything like that. They start in a chair, they end in a chair, super easy. And let's look at the care plan for this skill. Care plan says to ambulate the resident at least 10 steps. Use a gauge or transfer belt. Patient will be sitting in a chair at the side of the bed with shoes on. Patient's able to walk, but needs assistance to stand. So they can walk. But we're going to hold on to that gate belt to feel any wobblies. We're going to walk slightly behind at the one side so we can keep them in our field of view. We're looking for anything that's un unnatural, abnormal, wobbly, pale, sweaty, hand movement, slowing down, anything that lets me know this is not going well. So for this skill, the evaluator is going to pay attention to what you are paying attention to. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is one of those skills though, that they throw you a little curveball. And I want you to be aware of it. Our care plan tells us to walk at least 10 steps. That's five steps forward, five steps back. Okay, not, not 10 steps. Huh? Okay. Yeah, okay. it's a return correct. So five one way, five back. So we're not walking far. It's not really the walking that we're being judged on here. It's what are you paying attention to? How do you raise the patient? How do you lower the patient? That's what they're looking for. And did you use a gate belt light? But the, the curveball that they're going to throw you is that before this skill starts, they're going to put something in your path and they're going to give you the care plan. And then they're going to tell you, okay, I want you to walk to the white table and back. <laughs> when do you need to move it? Before you need to That's right. Before you lift the patient. 
You've got to make sure that the walkway is clear of obstructions before you get the patient standing. I was. Why would that be important? Yeah. Yeah. If you have to leave the patient to take care of an obstacle, or if you're dragging the patient along to take care of an obstacle, <laughs> we've increased our fall potential. Does that make sense? So even though it's a curveball and I think it's a little bit sneaky, I understand why they're doing it. I'm actually in favor of it. Right, right. Okay. So let's talk about some skill specific things with this particular skill. We want to put the gate belt on while they're still sitting. Don't stand them up and put the gate belt on. Right, because we're supposed to use it to lift them. <laughs> Um, that brings up another thing. I have seen people lift patients without gate belts, like by taking your arms and pulling you. Well, if I'm going to pull you up by your arms, that means I'm pulling the top half of you. Most of our weight is in the bottom half. So this is called trailing weight. So if I'm holding at your shoulders and I'm pulling and I've got trailing weight that I'm trying to pull along, that means I've got to grip harder and pull, yeah, and pull harder. So that risks injury, doesn't it? Especially with the chest and breathing. Yeah. Now, when we understand that most of the nerves that run to our hands and arms run through the back of our arm area, if you're grabbing and pulling, you can actually damage those nerves. So that's not a good idea. So some CNAs have thought this through and thought, okay, that's not good. Let's not do that. But I don't really need a gate belt. They've got pants on. I'm just going to grab their pants and lift them that way. Yeah. Have you ever had a wedgie? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is a monster wedgie. And they'll move. Oh, your patients will move super quick. Super quick, but they're moving because you're hurting them, not because you're helping them. So using their pants, not a good option. A gate belt really is the best solution for this problem. Not the back of their arms, not their pants. Good? Okay. So we're going to put the gate belt on around the patient's waist over their clothing. We're going to help them to stand by holding that gate belt around the back or sides, depending on how big your patient is. It's never from the front. If I got a patient sitting there and I'm holding onto the front of the gate belt, and pulling, that's pulling their middle. Everything else is gonna trail. That's no good. Um, when we're walking, we always want the patient to lead their face, not ours. We're gonna walk slightly behind into one side. We're gonna hold that belt underhand, feeling for any wobblies. Ask them how they feel when we stand and as we walk. Assist the patient to both stand and sit. So holding the gate belt, we're gonna stand them up. Holding the gate belt, we're gonna help them sit. And we don't want to pull the belt off across the skin. So those are things we want to remember as we do this skill. So are you using one hand on the gate belt? Or you as we're walking one hand, when we're lifting two. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, when we're lifting two. So I'm going to show you this skill. Okay, so these are puzzle pieces. Of course, every skill we follow the care plan. We've already read it. We know we're going to do the opening. We don't need a barrier for this skill. And you can use one for the gate belt if you want to, but you don't need it. You can just carry the gate belt. Um, we're going to evaluate if we need gloves. Do we need them or not? As long as our patient is fully clothed, holding onto all of their own body fluids, and doesn't have any open areas that we're gonna come into contact with, we don't need a gate belt. Now, if the patient had a huge rash on their arm, would I need gloves? I'm sorry, don't need gloves, not a gate belt. If they had a huge rash on their arm, would I need gloves? Yeah. Bless you. Yes. We talked about skill specific. We've talked about shoe rules. And of course our 
still is always going to end with the closing. So we've now talked about how to do this. Let me show you how to do it. I need a volunteer, somebody to come sit down in this chair for me. Hey, here we go. <laughs> Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. Do you feel like going for a little walk? Sure. All right. I'm just going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands and I'll be right back. Move this table out of the way before we get started. Closed curtain. I have clean hands. Get my gate belt. Okay, Miss Jones, I'm going to put this gate belt around your waist. This is going to help me lift you to a standing position and provide a little stability while we're walking. Is that okay? Um, I see you have shoes on. Do they fit well? They do. And are your feet flat on the floor? Okay, I'm just going to slide this around your waist. Let me just relax. We're going to put it through the first guard by the alligator teeth and we're going to pull it so that it's snug four fingers i'm going to put it back through the second guard and tuck that in all right miss jones i'm going to help you stand up now you're going to put your hands on my shoulders and i'm going to put my hands around your waist and then on the count of three we're going to stand okay, okay. so i'm going to put one foot in front one foot beside two hands up here Ready? One, two, three. You feel that stability? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead and relax. Are you dizzy? No. no. I'm going to have you walk to the table at your pace. Good. Good. Okay, go ahead and turn around. And we're going to walk back to the chair. Good. Feel all right? Yep. Go ahead and turn around. Can you feel that chair behind you? Yeah. I'm going to help you sit. You're going to put your hands up here. And on the count of three, we're going to sit. One, two, three. Let me just remove the gate belt. Very good. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, I don't think so. Would you like a magazine before I go? Okay, call light is there. We're going to pretend you can reach it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go open the curtain. My environment is clean. I'm going to wash my hands, make any corrections, tell the evaluator my skill is done. Questions? Questions? That's an easy one. But there's a lot of this, this skill is 100% safety. Remember, safety counts big on the test. There's a lot of little points in this. That you want to make sure you get. Move obstacles. Talk about shoes. Make sure feet are flat on the floor. Put the gate belt on, snug, and check it. Count to three before you stand. Make sure you use proper body mechanics. When you're walking, make sure that you're behind the patient so you can see them. Hold on to that gate belt. Have them turn. Make sure you're asking, are you dizzy when you stand and as you walk? Go back to the chair, help them sit, remove the gate belt, and do your closing. So all of those, I mean, it's not a very long skill at all, but all of those checkpoints are important. Do we have to put the gate belt like in a long draft of the No, it's just going to uh, be uh, put back where you found it, okay. which for the testing center will be a hook on the wall or hanging off the supply shelf. I know it's going to sometimes have to use anything to use. Yeah, this is uh the this is one of those things that where it doesn't get laundered every time you use okay. it. Because it's going on over clothing. Okay. Similar to, you know, sitting on chairs. Right? It's clothing that's sitting on the chair. Okay. Right. Okay. Good question. All right. So now we're moving on. In your white book, turn to page 86. This is the longest skill.
partial bed bath. Okay. So this skill, if you look at the bottom of the page, you can see somebody with your level of experience um, should be able to complete this within 19 minutes. I mean, compare that to the one we just did for five. 19 minutes for a skill. That's crazy. It is long. The good news is if you get this for the test, you get two super short skills to go with it like respirations and range of motion. Cool. <laughs> cool. This is not a hard skill, it is a long skill, but it uses almost every single one of those principles back there. Mm -hmm. The only one it doesn't use is shoe rolls. Everything else is in play. So I have to teach this after we've gone over all of those so that it becomes familiar. Make sense? So let's look at, well, let me, at the bottom of the page, you'll see this is gonna be done on a mannequin for the test. This is not a live patient skill. So let me go to the care plan. So our care plan tells us to give the resident a partial bed bath and back rub. Wash the resident's face, neck, chest, abdomen, back, and one arm and hand with soap and water. Provide a brief back rub with lotion. Dress the resident in a hospital gown. Patient is lying on back in center of bed and can roll as directed, but is too weak to assist with bathing. So super long care plan. I'm going to shorten this for you, make it super easy. It's face to waist, front and back, one arm. Face to waist. We're going to wash the face first. No soap on the face. Soap dries the skin, can get into the eyes and stain. No soap on the face, water only. So face to waist, front and back, one arm and hand. You get to pick which one, they don't care. And face first, no soap. So that's how we remember all of that. Okay. So I'm gonna wash one arm. Yeah. So that that's a, a question, right? So why do we only want? I mean, the patient has two. Clearly, the patient has two. Why am I only washing you one? The ones you can do the skill from the one side to do obviously. This yeah. Side. So this is a time saving thing for the test. If they watch you do it on one side, they don't need to see it on the other. So it kind of, we're already at 19 minutes. So <laughs> we're doing what we can to cut this down a little bit. I don't feel that they have an artificial arm. Okay, easy. absolutely. But is, is it possible that we might only be washing one arm mm -hmm. in a clinical setting? Mm -hmm. What if the patient has severe burns or an incision or shingles, rash, mm -hmm. or a cast? Right, there's a lot of reasons why we may be instructed just to wash one arm. We don't care. <laughs> we don't know why. It just tells us one. For the test, they're going to leave it up to you. Pick one. They don't care. For the test on vitals, does it have to be done on the left arm? Blood pressure is not tested. Oh. On the test. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so doesn't matter. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is not tested. Yeah, not tested. Um, it used to be uh, they about six years ago, they took it off the test. The next one that I think is going to, and I meant to talk to you guys about this. The next thing that I think is going to be removed from the test, and I would say in the next couple of years, we're going to see this is, oh, I don't have it here, is pulse. I think they're going to stop testing on manual pulse. Um, because we have pulse oxes and they're cheap, easily available. You can get them at Walmart now. So they're read readily accessible. Mm -hmm. And it just clips on the finger and it gives you the reading. So taking a manual pulse, I think, is going to be removed from the skill set for CNAs. Mm -hmm. And instead, in its place, I believe that they're going to put donning and doffing of PPE. So putting on um gown mask um i i wear 
and gloves and then taking it off. So donning and doffing PPE, I think, is what's going to be put in its place. But I do expect pulse to be removed from the test at some point. Uh, the last time they um, they met to assess the skills, they took out weight and blood pressure. So they do this periodically. Mm -hmm. um, they amend the skill sets. And like I said, this is what I'm expecting mm -hmm. um, in the, the near future. Another one that they may put on that is being tested in other states is the application of the TED hose. So putting the um, AE stockings on. So see this white stocking on her leg? It's putting that on um, because it's, yeah, it helps uh, reduce the likelihood of blood clot formation because it provides compression, but because it provides compression, it's kind of tricky to get on. Yeah, you really gotta, <laughs> yes, you really gotta stretch. Um, so I would expect that this is probably going to be added in at some point as well. Okay. But for you guys that are getting ready to test soon, none of these changes have happened, <laughs> um, but no blood pressure. All right, so face to waist, front and back, one arm and hand. They don't care which one. At the end of the skill, we're going to dress the resident in a clean gown. Well, that makes sense. Clean body, clean gown, that makes sense. But I wanna to talk to you about the gown real quick. You have two ways to do this and they don't care which one you take. Not graded on the test. You can wash the front of the body, rinse the front of the body, dry the front of the body and put the gown on. Turn the patient over, wash, rinse, dry the back, give the back rub and tie the gown. Or you can wash the front of the body, rinse the front of the body, dry the front of the body, turn the patient over, keep them covered with the blanket because they're still naked. Wash, rinse, dry the back, give a back rub, turn them back on their back, put the gown on turn them back on their side, tie the gown. It's a lot more movement for the patient. Yeah. And remember, they may be low on energy, even though you're doing the movement, it takes energy from them. So you're gonna see me do this skill, cleaning the front of the body, putting the gown on, turning the patient over, cleaning the back and tying the gown because it's less movement for the patient. Simply the better. Now, you can do it either way. There's no problem with dressing them at the very end. It's okay. But if you do that, please make sure that you remember they are undressed. So when you turn them on their back, you've got to make sure that blanket is firmly covering them so they're not exposed. Okay, good. Okay. It also tells us to provide a brief back rub with lotion. We are not massage therapists. We do not deep tissue anything. Not our job. This is for circulation purposes. It's a light back rub with lotion. We're going to start at small of the back, go up to the shoulders and circles, and we're going to do it three times. And this is just because they're laying on their back. Right? Remember, all those blood vessels are getting squished. No good circulation right now. So we're just trying to wake everything up get some blood flowing in the area, but it's also to help the patient feel better. Do you remember when you were little and you didn't feel good? Mom came along, rubbed your back real light. You know, I hope you feel better. It just makes you feel cared about, cared for, makes you feel a little better. That also is the purpose of this back rub for circulation and emotional well-being. We're not trying to work out anything. No knots, no, you know, it's not, it's not that kind of a back rub. Okay, you guys understand why the back rub is there? Mm -hmm. Back rubs used to be a very big part of CNA work. A very big part of CNA work. Again, not deep tissue anything, but promoting circulation, overall sense of well being, cared about, cared for, that type of thing. But unfortunately, back rub, because CNAs are asked to do more with less staff. So a lot of these things have kind of gone by the wayside. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is, but it is vitally important. And you need to understand that this is probably the most important part of bed bath. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some skills specific things. Oh, well, okay. I'm going to put this up, but we're, we're, I want to show you this first. So when we're washing wet body openings, a wet body opening is any area on the body that can let stuff out or let stuff in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So your eyes are wet body openings. So is your nose and your mouth, your genitals, your anal area, wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions are all wet body openings. They're different than intact skin. I have intact skin here. I have no body openings. So nothing's getting out, nothing's getting in. I can wash here and keep going. <laughs> Because nothing's getting out, nothing's getting in. But if I wipe one eye, now I've got stuff on that washcloth that I could deposit in the other eye. So when you're washing wet body openings, whatever it is, we have to use a different way of washing. And this is called the leaves method. So this is a washcloth. I gave each of you one. It's just a square washcloth. Generally speaking, we have it folded in half and then in half again, and we probably have these hanging out in our looming closet at home, folded in a square like this. But instead of looking at it as a square, I want you to look at it as a diamond. If you hold this diamond in your hand with the three ends pointing up, these leaves, and you tuck the side in by your thumb and the other side in by your pinky, now you've got an area you can use to wash something. So you wipe an eye and then you fold that down, which traps the contamination underneath. You've got a clean area to clean the other eye. You can then fold that down, giving you a new cleaning surface to clean the face. And you can fold that down to give you a new cleaning surface to clean the nose. And if you needed to, you could fold that down and get a new cleaning surface to clean something else. This is how we prevent cross-contamination. Now, it is possible to just take a washcloth and use a different area of the washcloth for every stroke, but chances are you're going to forget what you used and what you didn't. And it's really hard. Remember I said you've got to keep control of the washcloth? You guys remember that? No you know, drippy, wet washcloths that just go everywhere. So if we have to keep control of this and we're trying to change areas of the washcloth, it becomes very difficult. So if you use this leaves method, it allows you to keep control of the washcloth and it gives you five independent cleaning surfaces. Oh. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. yeah, I have used this more with my children <laughs> than I have in healthcare. This is just a handy tip to know. Okay, good. That's called the leaves method, and we're going to use it if you're watching any wet body openings. Well, for this skill, our wet body openings are just on the face. Because remember, face to waist, front and back. All of this skin is intact. This is all fine. So I'm only going to use that leaves method on the face. Face first, no soap. Okay. All right, so our skill specific steps that we want to remember, we're going to wash face to waist, front and back with one arm, face first, no soap. We're going to use leaves method on the face. We want to control that washcloth during cleaning, no floppy corners. We want to support the arm at the elbow when lifting. We've heard that before. We want to replace the water if it gets cold or soapy. We shouldn't put soap in there, but we can put a rinsing washcloth in there if we need to keep it warm for later, which you're going to see because you didn't apply soap to the rinse washcloth, so it can go back in the rinse water. 
We're gonna turn on side to wash, rinse and dry the back. We're gonna give a brief back rub of lotion and we're gonna apply a clean gown. So there's, you know, that's how we're going to do this skill. Any questions on that? This is the longest skill, 19 minutes long. But it's not hard. Okay. Okay, so I told you that this used almost all of our puzzle pieces. <laughs> so when you look at this, you tend to go, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. that's a lot. And it is a lot. I mean, we're using absolutely everything except for shoe rolls. But we already know these. We went over them earlier today when we first started. We did a review. You know the skill rules. We follow the care plan. You know the opening. It never changes. We know to use a barrier, and that's the first thing we get. We know that we have to evaluate gloves. And if I'm going to be touching the face, ooey gooey, so I probably need some gloves. I'm also touching the breast, personal skin, so I need some gloves. Um, we talked about skill specific. Linen rules apply. Don't hold them up next to your uniform. Use what you take. Anything else goes in dirty linen. We know we have to use privacy blanket because this patient is undressed. We know that we're going to scoot and roll to turn them over on their side. We know our washing rules, whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry. We check the water, they check the water. We know we clean the basin the same way. And we know we do our closing. So there's nothing new here other than the leaves method. There's nothing new here for you to learn. Nothing other than the leaves. So even though this skill is long and it looks complex with all of those steps to it, it's stuff you're already familiar with. Okay. I try to point that out because this can get, you know, I mean, people go, oh my gosh. There's like, I don't know, 42 steps in this. You know, I mean, it's a lot of steps. Mm -hmm. Don't panic too much because you already know most of it. I'm going to show you the video for this one because it's got really good close ups of the eyes in the face and the back rub and all of that. So you'll notice this uh, whole video takes 12 minutes and 55 seconds to 12, 13 minutes. But that includes the all of this and the credit. So it doesn't take 19 minutes. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I need to do partial bed bath. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. For this skill, I'm going to need a barrier for the table. This will give me a clean place to put my clean supplies. For this skill, I will need four washcloths, two towels, a clean gown and a privacy blanket. It's a washing skill, so I will often need a basin, soap, and lotion. And I'll need a set of gloves. Ms. Jones, let me go get some water. I'll be right back. Ms. Jones, is this water appropriate temperature? Okay. 
And now I'm going to spread the privacy blanket out over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill. I'm going to spread the blanket without snapping or shaking the blanket. And I'm going to pull your sheet down to about your waist. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to sit forward for me in just a moment so I can untie your gown. And I'm going to spread this towel out underneath you to keep your sheets dry while we bathe you. Can I assist you to sit up, please? Thank you. I'm going to untie your gown and spread the towel out on the bed. Go ahead and lay back down, Ms. Jones. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to spread the towel out underneath the arm. I'll remove the gown on the side closest to me, supporting the elbow as I lift it. And I'm going to relocate the gown to the other side of the patient. This leaves the patient uncovered underneath the privacy blanket for baby. The blanket will keep you warm. Now I can apply my gloves. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out. And I'm going to use four corners. We'll wash the face first, no soap on the face. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your eyes. I'll start with the closest eye to me. I'm going to wash from the inner to outer corner. Very gently. And then we'll fold this sleeve over to prevent contamination from spreading to the other eye. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your other eye now, inner to outer corner. We'll fold that leaf over. And then I'm going to wash the remainder of the face. Using very gentle strokes. And keeping control over the washcloth. We'll fold that leaf over and use the final washcloth for the nose. And then we'll set that aside. I'm going to take the towel and pat dry all areas of her face, making sure not to use too much force. We'll set the towel aside. We're going to take the second washcloth and wring it out. And we'll apply soap to the top leaf. We do not need to use the leaves method because all of her skin from this point is intact. We're going to wash behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso. We're gonna lift the blanket to protect privacy, but keep the patient covered while we wash down to the abdomen and up the side. Now for the exam, you are going to make sure the patient remains covered until the evaluators ask you to remove the blanket. At that point, you will just continue on. I am going to repeat these actions so that you can see what I have done. I'll remove the blanket for better visualization. Behind the ears, across the chin, the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts, down the abdomen and up the side. Then we'll clean down the front of the arm, the hand, up the back of the arm, lifting at the elbow and the armpit last. We'll set this washcloth aside because it has soap on it. We'll take the third washcloth in the basin and wring it out. And we're gonna rinse all the areas that we just washed. So behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts, the abdomen, up the side, down the front of the arm, keeping the elbow supported on the bed. We'll rinse the hand, the back of the arm, and the armpit while supporting the arm. The rinse washcloth can go back in the basin for later use. Now we're going to dry all of those areas. 
So we're going to pat dry or use short, soft strokes, but nothing vigorous. Go ahead and withdraw Miss Jones. We'll set the towel aside. Now the patient has a clean torso, so we'll place the clean gown on her. Ms. Jones, can you reach your arm through here? I'll help you put your gown on. We'll lift the arm at the elbow, supporting it as we lift. And we'll spread the gown out. Okay, Ms. Jones, we're going to go around to the other side of the bed now, and we'll dress the other arm. Since the care plan said that we only needed to wash one arm, we do not need to cleanse this other arm. That's per the care plan, but we do need to dress it. So I'll remove the soiled gown and we're gonna place this in dirty linen. And then I'll put the new gown on. Ms. Jones, can you reach through this arm hole? Thank you. And go ahead and lift. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to turn on to your left side now. This is going to allow me to wash your back and give you a brief back rub. So I'm going to ask you to scoot toward me and we're going to roll you onto your left side. Ready? Go ahead and scoot toward me. One, two, three. Now the evaluator will hold the mannequin in place while you complete your cleaning. I'm going to take the third washcloth, wring it out, and we'll soak the top leaf. I'm going to wash the back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. We'll set that washcloth aside. We'll take the final washcloth and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all of those areas. The back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. And then finally, we'll dry all of those areas. Back of the neck and the shoulders, the back down to the waist. Now our care plan asks us to give the patient a brief back rub. So we're going to use a little bit of lotion, making sure to warm the lotion in our hands before we give them a back rub. Ms. Jones, I'm going to give you a little back rub now. I'm going to start at the small of your back and work my way up in small circles to your shoulder. We'll do this three times. This is for circulation purposes. One, two, one more, and three. I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion. Now I can tie the patients down. and remove the towel that's protecting the linens. Ms. Jones, come on back onto your back, please, and scoot to the middle of the bed. Thank you. I do not want to touch that sheet. It's going to go right up next to her face with soiled gloves, but I need my soiled gloves to take care of all of my dirty linens. Ms. Jones, I'll be right back. These items are going to go into dirty linen. Now I'm going to go clean the basin. I'll empty the basin and rinse it. And then pick it up with a paper towel. I'll dry the inside with one paper towel and throw it away. And then dry the outside with a paper towel and throw that away. And I'll get one for the door. I'll collect the soap and the lotion, placing them in the basin, and return the basin to its store for storage. Paper towels can be thrown away. This barrier is going to be discarded. And now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to remove your privacy blanket now and pull your sheet back up. Are you comfortable? Good. 
We're going to roll the privacy blanket in a ball so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. This will be placed in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Such as magazine? No? Okay, here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. I'm going to open the privacy curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay. Any questions? You did mention that the coal light on the test must be physically in the hand. Yeah, there are, well, how do I put this? About half of the skills um, actually say it must be physically in the hand. The other half says it must be near the hand. Okay. It's just easier if you put it in, you know, rather than trying to remember which is which, just put it in your hand for all of them. Yeah. I don't want that little slight deduction. <laughs> yeah. And if, um, I mean, I can tell you which ones, but. The safety reason is put it on for everything. Yeah, it's the, the easiest way. Um, okay, like sideline position, it says that you have to leave the call light um, in the hand on the side that they've turned toward. Okay. Uh, let's see here. It's near, 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 near. Mm -hmm. On dressing a resume, you have to leave the call light on the stronger side. Um, Basically, with the wording, you must really pay attention to. Well, I just, yeah, I I usually just tell my students, just put it in their hand. Okay. Yeah, and that is another one. I just can't find it off the top of my head here. Um, just put it in their hand. All right. Any questions on those skills? Okay, hey, we've covered a lot of information. We only have six skills left to go. That's it. So we're going to have three skills on Wednesday, and you're going to have three on the following Monday to wrap everything up. The three skills that you're going to learn on Wednesday, um, transfer out of bed and into a wheelchair. Do you remember uh, ambulate that we learned today? It's a variation of that. Body mechanics are the same, gait belt is the same, the rules are all the same, but instead of lifting them up and then walking, we're lifting them up, turning them and sitting them down in a wheelchair. We have to learn about wheelchair safety. So there is some new stuff to learn on that one. We're going to learn peri care. Do you remember partial bed bath we just learned? Mm -hmm. Peri care follows the same rules. We're going to use the leaves method, whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry. But we have to learn about incontinence and the risk for urinary tract infection. So we have some stuff to learn there. And we're going to learn how to feed a resident in a chair that doesn't follow any of our normal rules. <laughs> So it's it's kind of the outlier. It doesn't follow a lot of our rules. So Wednesday, we've got a lot to learn still. Monday, the very last three skills, it's variations of stuff we've already covered. So we're going to end really easy. So you've only got one more day of kind of tough learning ahead. And I wouldn't even call it tough, you know. Um, but one more day of learning, and then next week, it's it gets a little easier. 
What do you do if a patient says no? Yeah, stop, try to find out why if you can and then let the nurse know. We don't have to solve that problem. But I do have a, a lesson in the book that you can read on that on page 47 if you'd like. What I'd like to do now though, is if you turn to page 41, in your white book. We have covered all of these skills. They are now behind us. So I want you to take about five minutes to do this uh, unit one test on page 41. And I want you to do the unit four test on page 89. So page 41 and 89. And then we're going to go over that together in class. In the meantime, I'm going to print out your review sheets for today. So 41 and 89. Just take a few minutes. You need pen? No, I didn't. Oh, you did it already? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, let me print out your review sheets. And this is what I just passed out is today's re review sheet.
Okay, let's go over uh, page 41. You can do um, you can do page 89 on your own. But let's, I, I do want to go over this one. So number one, for the nor for following vital signs, indicate if they're normal or abnormal. So pulse of 78, is that normal or abnormal? Normal. Normal. What about respirations 22? Normal. Abnormal. Normal. Abnormal, because respirations 12 to 20 is normal. What about respirations 14? Normal. Normal. Blood pressure, 108 over 66. Normal. Normal. I like that blood pressure. Can I order that, please? <laughs> Uh, blood pressure 142 over 96. Normal. Abnormal. That's more like mine. Uh, pulse of 85. Normal. Normal. Pulse of 114. Normal. Abnormal. Blood pressure 90 over 54. Normal. Abnormal. That's low. Seriously ill patients may need frequent vital sign monitoring as often as every 15 minutes. How will you know how often to obtain vital signs on your assigned patients? Check the care plan. Which of the following vital signs would need to be reported to the nurse immediately? C. Now, that number three, I want you to put a star next to that because you're going to see a question similar to this on the state exam. This question is similar. And some? some of them are similar. Some of them are just to make sure that you got the information so that, that you absorbed it. But the ones that are similar to the state exam, I'm, that's what I'm telling you. So number three would be similar to the state exam. Okay. Um, number four would be similar to something you would see on the state exam as well. Which of the following skills would require gloves, okay. assuming the patient has no open wounds, rashes, or skin openings? B, mouth care. Very good. Which of the following is an important documentation principle? Now, this is asking if you read something that we did not go over in class. So this is one of the, um, in uh, the second column on uh, last Monday, class three, it asked you to read documentation principles on page 36. So um, which of the following principle is an important documentation principle? C. C, be accurate, brief, and complete. Very good. Number six, which of the following does not indicate a need to wear gloves? A, a. a. a fully clothed patient needs help walking. So these, uh, you know, when are gloves appropriate type questions, you may have something like that on the state exam. Which of the following would you not tell a patient? C, I'm going to count your respirations. Why? Yeah, it alters their breathing. Good. Which of the following is not an action required at the end of the skill? Yeah, you wouldn't introduce yourself after it's over. Oh, by the way, <laughs> um, during hand washing, which of the following actions is required? C, use adequate soap to provide a rich lather. And number 10, regarding the opening, which of the following is true? B, hand washing is done after closing the curtain. So when you're looking at this, um, number two, three, four, five, six, and nine, are all, all possible test questions. Five, Something six, similar to that, nine. yep. So they're not gonna ask you about the opening and the closing. That's just how I um, present the information. Those are actually my terms, not the state, okay? So anything that asks you about these principles, that's my teaching, not the state. But I find it's an easier way to present the information where you'll remember it. So did that help you kind of sum up everything that we learned from unit one? Yeah. Do you feel a little more confident than you did the first day you walked in? Yeah. I know you're still anxious because you have a test. 
I can't do much about that. <laughs> Anxiety, it kind of goes with the game. But I do want you to have a little bit more comfort and confidence in yourself that you understand the principles and what's expected of you. So you can do 89 on your own. And it will help you identify whether you got the information from unit four as well. So when you come into class on Wednesday, um, you need to read chapter seven homework tonight or, you know, before Wednesday. And you want to take the test on page 138. Um, but we're going to go over three skills. It's not going to take me all class to go over three skills. You're going to have about an hour of practice on Wednesday. And today we have 45 minutes of practice. So I can't keep you here. This is adult education. <laughs> I can't lock the door and keep you here. Anybody that needs to go, you are welcome to leave during practice. But if you're not practicing here, make sure you're practicing somewhere because you don't want the first time you do these skills to be for the test. You will make mistakes. First time you do anything, you will make mistakes. You want to do that. You want to make your mistakes when you're practicing, not when you're testing. Mm -hmm. So if you're not practicing here, make sure you're practicing somewhere. Okay. But the rest of the class is devoted to practice. So anything that we've gone over so far is open to practice. I would suggest personally starting out with something kind of easy, like range of motion. That way you can get comfortable with your opening, with hand washing, with closing, or maybe, you know, counting respirations or something like that. Okay. Start out with the easy. <laughs> Okay, uh, for those of you who are joining in at home, I am going to end the feed now because you, um, with the cameras, you can't really see what's happening here. Please, if you're uh, joining us from home, make sure you are practicing as well because you need to practice. Um, here, I can see what they're doing and I can help them. I'm not able to help you guys at home. So keep that in mind and I will see you on Wednesday at nine. Hopefully I can get technology working by then. <laughs> Bye.